iHeartRadio presents Podversations, a weekly discussion with the biggest names and influencers in podcasting. Hey, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us for um, this week's session of the iHeart Podcast Speaker Series. Um, this is uh, officially my favorite part of the week. I get to take a break and for about a half an hour talk to a creator that we are in uh, that we're in partnership with at iHeart Media. And uh, our excuse, so to speak, for being in partnership with that creator is podcasting, um, one of our favorite and the newest mass reach medium in the United States. Um, but these conversations usually sort of meander into places well beyond podcasting too, about what what drives these creators, what's their origin stories, what gets them up in the morning, what keeps them going, why they've chosen a career of creativity and content, and in this case, podcasting. Um, my guest this week is uh, a, an incredible story. Danelle Morton is an investigative journalist. Uh, she's a best-selling co-author of 20 books. She's worked at the New York Times, the San Jose Mercury News, People, ghostwritten a lot of books for very well-known people. She has partnered with iHeart to create a show called City of the Rails. Uh, City of the Rails has been out a few weeks. It's one of the biggest 100 podcasts in the world right now across pretty much any platform where you might go and find podcasts. Um, I'll set it up this way, Danielle, and then I'll sort of throw to you. Uh, your daughter left town to hop trains. And this prompted in you this sort of instinctive uh, response, I think, not just as an investigative journalist, but as a human, as a mother, to find out what she was doing, where she had gone, what this world is that she had entered into in this sort of uh, secret shadow underbelly world of the trains in the United States. Um, and I think it. we were just talking before we went live on this conversation about where that instinct came from, what drove you to do that? Maybe just talk us through the the origin of this honestly phenomenal, incredible, shocking, all of the above story. How did it start? Well, it started at my daughter's high school graduation, where she, um, it was a very small high school where everyone was allowed to speak directly to the audience. And most people came, most students came, there were like 12 of them, I think, to say thank you to the parents and thank you to the school. But my daughter, who is a very talented musician, walked up to this podium and sang a song, the refrain of which is, oh, look what I've done. I've gone and made a fool of everyone. So I'm sitting in the audience and I'm thinking, who is she making a fool of? We go off to the reception and she splits. She didn't even go to the reception. She didn't say goodbye. Her Some of her train hopping friends were in the back of the, the, the graduation and she left. And it took me a couple of days to figure out that it wasn't like she went off with a bunch of her friends and like, I don't know, went to a party and forgot to come home, but that she was actually gone. So my suspicion was the trains because I had an open door policy at my house. Anybody could show up for dinner. And as she got further into her senior year, the guests were older. They were some of these musicians and some of them hopped trains. And every time they would describe this world of the train hopping, you know, your heart goes with them because you all, I think a lot of Americans have this one, number one, let me get me out of here. I am done with this. I just want to go. And the image that you think of is, I could just cop a train. Nobody would know where I am. These people live that life. So why did she do this? And bigger than that, who was she? You know, I mean, you have this child. I think a lot of parents know this. You have a child who lives with you for 18 years. You think you know them. But how how did this happen? So I am, as you said, trained as a journalist. And I thought, I'm going to find out about this world. I'm going to find out about the world that my daughter chose. At first, I thought she was running away from me and the world that I held out to her. And I think that was part of it. But she was running towards something. And what were the values of this world? Who were the people in it was something I was determined to find out. And that's kind of like the basis of the podcast is what I found when I followed my daughter into the city of the rails. Did you see this coming when she sort of escaped your world and into this other world? Did was it a total shock? Yes. I mean, you know, we'd had a little bit of a conflict about graduation, but she graduated. Um, 
And we had, you know, she had applied to a very prestigious school and she had gotten a scholarship and everything. So I thought that was what was happening. And I think when you talk about this train hopping world, I'll speak for myself, maybe everybody listening and watching this, it, it feels like a the stuff of lore or books or a bygone era, at least. It doesn't feel like the the United States, the America we're, we're in today. But you're saying, no, this is a this is a absolutely vibrant, active, secret underworld or whatever you might call it. Just describe it to us a little bit. What, in fact, are we talking about? Well, you're talking about people who reject the world that we have created. Um, you know, one of the people who I talked to in the first uh, episode, they I say, you know, why do you do this thing? Like, why do you choose to get your food out of a dumpster? Why do you choose to live in an illegal squat where you get arrested at any moment? She said, because I want to and because I can. There's so much waste in the world. I don't want to participate in that. I want to, I can live for free and I'm not responsible to anyone. I can go where I want when I please. And just the feeling of that is something that's so alien to the way we are bound up. You know, not only are we bound up in our own economic responsibilities or familial responsibilities, but we're also attached to technology and to all these other things that are like monitoring us. And they have taken a step away from that. They are rejecting that. So I found that part of it fascinating. And I guess there is this notion of that's familiar, this notion of wanting to retreat, wanting to escape, um, wanting to maybe simplify back down our lives, that even as you describe it there, it's it resonates. It just as a human being, it resonates. this this wanting to go 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 back to the land, go back to a simpler version of life. But it also feels incredibly dangerous. Oh, <laughs> this, oh. this, this underworld that you're talking about, or this subculture, I'm not quite sure the name to put it, incredibly dangerous. Incredibly and I, dangerous. I, in a sense, my heart goes out to you insofar as I have two daughters. I cannot imagine watching them disappear into this kind of a world. But just talk to us about the dangers of it a little bit. Is that I imagine that's very real. Yes. Well, you can imagine um, you know, the railroads are not in the most... Um, safest parts of American cities. They're in some of the most dangerous neighborhoods in the world. And the, and the trains themselves are, are, you know, enormous beasts that weigh hundreds of thousands of pounds. And if you get entangled with them, you're gonna at the minimum lose a limb. Even the act of, of running to catch a train. So this guy describes it in episode three, four, where you run alongside the train, you throw your pack up onto the boxcar, then you have to use your upper body strength to hoist yourself up into the boxcar. This is the crucial moment, because if you don't do that act with a lot of force and confidence, you slip back under the train. And there's lots of people who lose their limbs that way. So there's that. Also, you know, you have to be able to rely on the people that you're with. Um, many people told me you learn more about the people that you're traveling with in a few days than you know about some members of your family, because you're in these extreme circumstances. You're looking for your basics. You're looking for food, water, shelter every day. So how you arrange that is a, is a matter of trust. You know, have to trust one another. You have to trust one another when things get dire. If you get injured in some way, do you have money to go to the doctor? And are you, most of them don't even want to um, interact with regular society in any way. So there's going to be self-reliant. So if you can imagine this from a parent's perspective, you're thinking she's cold, she's hungry. She may be wounded in some way. How do I know what's going on? Only thing I could do, because you have to do something. As a parent, you feel like you have to do something. I know there's some parents who'd be like, well, she's gone and I'm just going to try not to think about it, but I'm not that kind of parent. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, I mean, you're you're definitely not. And as an investigative journalist, you're probably thinking, I also have the know-how of, I'm pretty good at this. I could probably have I have a I have a crack at trying to trying to find her. Was there a moment in the search and the in the investigation and the research you were doing where you're like, oh, I think I've got a lead on another lead on another lead, maybe, and that that might lead me to her. Was there a pivot point? Well, you know, she did occasionally call. 
And I had a little sort of reporting station set up in my house for, and where I had a special notebook for whenever she called. And even though um, I was interrogating her, I tried to make it sound very casual. I would be like, oh, well, who are you with now? You used to be with so-and-so and so-and-so. Who are you with now? Write down all their names. Write down the cell phone number that she was calling me from in case I needed to try to find her, I could have used that cell phone number. Then if I would say to her, like, where are you? Because sometimes when you're on a train, you don't know where you are. Um, just say, what is the most recent landmark that you found? Like, where did you? So I always had kind of like a basic approximation of where she was. And people do come in and off the rails. So there were times when she was someplace for a while, you know, and she would call me. She would call me like every two, three weeks, maybe. Um, so I could get a beat on where she was. So it was more like um, became a puzzle of why. Do you feel like you ever found out why or was it just this basic escapism that all humans have to some extent? Or is there something specific about your daughter? You know, um, I think that the 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 notion of rejecting the world that's the, the our world the world on this side of the tracks mm. is really a big motivation and the feeling of like i'm not going to answer to anyone i'm just going to be like today i'm going to wake up and decide what i'm going to do and there's nobody who can tell me one way or the other because i don't have to make any money like one guy said as opposed to working hard to make money, I worked hard not to make money. Mm. I wanted to live a life where money was not necessary. And when I was in New Orleans working on a different part of this story, one of the women that I met pointed to $3 that was on a crate in the squat that she was living in. And she said, I've had those $3 sitting there for a week. I haven't had to spend any money for an entire week. So that's the motivation is to not have to be pushed around by the urgencies that are created from without, have only the urgencies that come from within. Did that resonate with you? Was there a part of it even for you that you were like, I kind of get that? <laughs> well, you know, um, I'm a big anti-authoritarian and it hasn't actually served me well in my career. I know how to, uh, you know, tell somebody off and say, I'm out of here, but I'm not brave enough to hold the train. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, to say to the whole world, I'm gone, and you couldn't figure out why I left. Yeah, and, I, and or what? And uh, sorry, I don't have a cell phone anymore. I just, you know, I'm not that much of an outsider. I'm just not. Is it safe to word to use uh, use the word um, hobo? Is that a, is that an acceptable? Uh, you know, that's an interesting question because I know a lot of people have heard that hobo is like a slur. You know, that it's sort of um, akin to calling somebody a a bum. You yeah. know what I mean? Or like, yeah. a, like a slur for homeless people. But inside the world of the hobo class, it's not. In fact, in the first episode, uh, one of the hobos that I'm hanging out with on the side of the hill when he's about to hop a train describes how you have to earn it, that he considered himself a hobo, able to use that honor only after he'd been tra train hopping for more than five or six years. I think he said 10 years. He said like a journeyman plumber. I mean, to know this world because everyone thinks when they think of train hopping, they think of, oh, you're on this um, box car and you're free. But they don't really think about, okay, how do you choose the train that's going where you want to go? You know, and that there's a whole science to that and a way to analyze the, the content, the cargo that um, the train is carrying and go, okay, well, that's got lumber on it. And it's it's probably heading to San Francisco where it's gonna be transported to China. We export a lot of lumber to China. So that's my train, cause I'm going to Oakland. And there's a secret guidebook, which I actually got a copy of called the Crew Change that is created by hobos. They all um, file information to this listserv where they say, oh, this yard has changed. You know, the place that we used to get on doesn't, you know, you can't get through at that point anymore. You have to go in another way. And here's where you get eastbound trains going to this, 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 this place. So it's passed around from hobo to hobo as like a secret guide to the underworld. It's incredible. I mean, it, should we assume that how prevalent is this? Like, should we assume that every one out of three trains we see probably has hobos tucked away in some car or is it like, nah, not quite that much, but it, but it is a, 
It is a lot. I, I, I can't get a sense of this. Well, there's only a few cars that uh, hobos can actually ride in. Um, and if you look at a double stack train, you know, when there are two, uh, you know, cars stacked on top of one another, those are least likely to have um, hobos in them. Boxcars are, le- there are fewer boxcars than there've ever been. There's all sorts of other specialized cars. There's a car called a grainer that is shaped like this. They put grain in. There's also a little, there's a little cover on the side in a hole in it and you can slip into that hole and be undetected. So when an experienced rider stands at the side of the yard, they assess the available rides. And sometimes they're looking for a very specific car. The first episode, um, the hobo that I'm with says, I'm looking for a very specific car, you know, and it's called a pig with wings. <laughs> pig with wings, huh? Never heard that before. We always think, oh, box cars, right? And there, there's also all of this technique Right. If you get into a box car, you can't do it unless you've got a railroad spike in your hand. Why? Because if the box car door slams shut, you're trapped inside the box car. Oh wow! So you've got to spike the the door so that if it slams shut because of the motion, you still have a way to get out because you could die inside a box car. Did you feel in danger yourself a lot, or were you always sort of an outsider? And I'm an outsider. I'm definitely an outsider, and a lot of co- hobos have, you know, you're an outsider. Yeah. On the other hand, I have um, a journalist curiosity and lack of judgment. I mean, I'm dri- driven by a certain amount of urgency, but I'm also more curious than I am judgmental, and I think that that always comes across in speaking with the people that are from the outside. You know. There's sort of a backdrop to the whole story that that I think is your personal story, but the backdrop to that is is, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it feels like the story of America. The railroads are so intertwined with the story of and the history of our country, um, in obvious ways and less obvious ways. But as you dug into this in this search and investigation around your daughter, talk about that a little bit. What what came to light for you around how this is really a story about the country to some extent? Well, this, the railroads are the beginning of corporate America. They are the first um, uh, business that was operated on a glo- on a national scale. So they created a lot of the corporate dodges and things that you know protect the modern corporation. For instance, the corporate the corporate personhood that we are su- that we have today started in the 1860s with the railroads trying to use the Fourteenth Amendment that freed the slaves to make themselves into people to give rights to them as as corporations that were the kind of rights that you get as a person lobbyists were created by the railroads why because after the civil war there was a lot of expansion of the rails and huge government subsidies i mean a lot of people know about the fact that all this land was given to the railroads for free so they could lay their trap uh, historian Richard White estimates that if you put together all of the land that was given to the railroads for free, it would be the size of the state of Alaska. But there was more than that. There were federal subsidies for um, railroad construction. There were federally guaranteed bonds. So anybody who wanted a railroad was trying to get this from the government. So where did they hang out? In the lobby of the Willard Hotel, where all of the com- Congress people came, and in the lobby of Congress, hence the name lobbyists. Railroads invented time zones. So most before the railroad, transcontinental railroad was made, the power axis in the United States was north to south. But when it became east to west, noon in Chicago is not the same time as noon in New York. So how are you going to calibrate the timing of the trains? Well, railroad engineers divided the country, the, the world, into time zones so that they could calibrate the arrival of the trains which led to Einstein's theory of relativity because Einstein was in the patent office in Bern, Switzerland, getting all of these patents about how to calibrate time, which made him understand things are relative from one place to another became the basis of the theory of relativity. And I could go on, but I'll stop. (laughs) (laughs) I think honestly, like to to pull this back down into podcasting a little bit, (laughs) I almost I, I don't want to do it. I want you to go on and on. I think what you're talking about though is what podcasting does really, really well. Um we have a medium here in podcasting that we at iHeartMedia fell in love with a few years ago. And it's it's been some of the most exciting and I think honestly 
innovative content happening in the world today is podcasts. But the way you describe the 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 effects, the ripple effects of the railroad industry from you personally all the way through to a physics defying theory of relativity and everything in between um, is what podcasters are really good at. It's sort of this medium lets you follow a story into the nooks and crannies and the meandering paths that it's supposed to take as opposed to formatting it into a stricter structure or anything like that. What what has surprised you about the the podcast medium? What do you like about it that you didn't really realize it was that good at or or anything like that? Well, one of the things that I really was excited about was the ability to use sound to tell the story because everyone has an emotional connection to the sounds of the trains and to be able to communicate that this means something to you. You that that very emotional connection. Well, they're having to like put a big re- neon arrow at it and go, you care. Yeah. But when you hear that train, when you hear that whistle, it arouses the heart of you that says, is this it? Can I get out of here? Is there some other place I could go? Could I just like get on the train, you know, and without having to say that stuff? I think that is an enormous gift to storytelling. The other thing is the very talented people from iHeart that I've been working with, not saying too much, you know, like trying to just say enough so that people get the point because people are very smart. I've come from the print world where you, you know, like, okay, here we're going to have three paragraphs about lobbying. They want to tell it in four sentences. And I think that gets it across just as effectively with the other tools that are available to you through um, sound and other things with podcasting. And then the other thing is, who's going to read a book these days? I mean, I've written a lot of books, but you know, who's going to, this is such an incredible opportunity to reach a big audience who may not have thought of these things before. And the fact that all of these different people from all of these different walks of life are coming to this podcast and starting to rethink their own lives. We had a mommy blogger who said, you know, this is making me think. I show up to work every day. I do the things I'm supposed to do. And at the end of the day, what does it amount to? And I'm like, wow, if we can reach a suburban mom with this podcast, I mean, they wish you wouldn't read a book about the rails. Same thing. Other side of this audience, a hobo sent me, left me a voicemail message. There's a, there's a number on the end of the podcast. Mm. And he said, I've been on the rails for 30 years. I'm 52 years old. And I thought, you know, I'm too old to get off the rails. But then I listened to your episode about, you know, moving into the barn. And I thought, I could do that. I could get off the rails. So just think about that ability that is of the podcast to touch a suburban mom and a hobo in the same episode. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it is a strangely deeply deeply moving medium it it really does have a way of taking a story and and literally and and figuratively getting in your head um i just want to thank you so much for hanging out with us uh, the, the the show that you've made city of the rails in partnership with with the iheart podcast network for everybody listening or watching this show hits you hard um it is extremely moving extremely smart when we talk about podcasting, creating some of the highest quality content in the world, period, in any medium, this, Danielle, is exactly the kind of show we're talking about. Thank um, you. It really is a pretty phenomenal work uh, and work of art, I think, that you've put out there. And it, and it's all the things we just talked about. It's a, it's a mother, you, coming to terms with what is moving and motivating her daughter. It's the story of America. It's deeply powerful. So I, I really appreciate you hanging out with us today, Danelle. And uh, I really do encourage everyone, just take a second, subscribe to the feed, listen to the first couple episodes. You you won't stop. But Danelle, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for uh, helping to get people to come listen to this show. And thank everybody. Uh, thanks to you all for, for hanging out with us today. We will see you next time on the iHeart Podcast Speaker Series. Take care. Be well. Talk soon. Podversations is a production of iHeartRadio. You can find more from the biggest names in podcasting on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts.